Last week, we spoke to the internet aristocrat, a YouTube personality who's had a lot to say on these issues. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, internet aristocrat. Although, of course, in America, you say aristocrat, don't you? Oh, that's correct. That's how we pronounce it. Or at least we do in the Midwest. Um, and, and what is your real name? Because I'm sure everybody wants to know who you are. You've been, you've been uh, publishing these wonderful videos and nobody knows who you are. A uh, man who values his anonymity. But uh, my first name is Jim. <laughs> Mo- most people know me by Jim, so that's fine. Fine. Well, if you don't mind, I will call you Jim. And, uh, of course, we will. Well, there are lots of good reasons why you, uh, you, you are quite right to, to keep your address to yourself. But if you don't mind, we will continue to call you Jim. What I want to ask you about, Jim, is uh, the subject I think the Gamergate movement is really leading up to, or the, certainly the, the area which is most serious and most pressing, which is press ethics. Now, you've been responsible for um, a lot of disclosures that have reached the, well, a wider audience thanks to your YouTube videos. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you think the main failures of the video game press have been to date. Um, what do you think is really going wrong? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say the main failures, really, when it comes to gaming journalism, uh, especially what we've seen over the last four weeks, has to do with their ability to, uh, I guess, clean house or to put their own affairs in order. Uh, we've constantly seen people from different websites like Kotaku or Polygon, where the uh, editor in chief uh, Stephen Tatello at Kotaku or Chris Grant at Polygon have addressed issues only when forced to. There's no pre or um, there's no proactive. Uh, approach with any of them. It's always reactive. They keep telling gamers, don't worry, there's nothing that's going wrong. Um, you know, we take our job seriously. We really do think of ourselves as journalists. And yet, all these issues that have come up would have had to have been things that they would have been well aware of as an editor in chief. You know, when you have employees that have romantic relationships with people in the industry, when you have employees that are living or have a landlord uh, tenant relationship with people they're writing about, or even financial connections which we've seen at all these sites, you would think their ability to, I don't know, oversee this or to keep some kind of a, an ethical standard in place would be easy, but none of them have. Um, and the attack that we've seen in response to even bringing up these issues has really, I think, opened a lot of gamers' eyes when we saw all this, uh, this deluge and this 24-hour period of gamers are dead. You know, um, your demographic isn't important anymore. You as a consumer are a, a dinosaur we're moving into a new, I, I guess, maybe political or ideological slant on what this is going to be and talking about it being you know, more artistic than entertainment. And it just, it seems like we're being bombarded with articles that are, are trying to dictate a new way of behaving and are trying to change this from something that's, you know, at the end of the day, a business. It's a hobby. People like games because it's a good form of entertainment. But the people that are reporting on it, the middlemen that get in between the producer and the consumer, seem to want to make it something else. And it creates this kind of disconnect between the people making games and the people buying games. And it creates confusion. So, there, yeah, there are a lot of issues, but I, I think the main one, I think the, the one thing that people are really focusing on is the inability of the gaming press to regulate itself. You know, uh, we all were kind of given this idea that the internet was going to be this great bastion of free speech, that the fifth estate was really going to show the fourth estate. You know, online journalism was going to show old press, old media, you know, print and television, how it was done. You know, they were going to be the underdogs. They were going to take the job seriously. They weren't going to be corrupt. And all we've seen is the same thing happen. You know, the, the fifth estate online journalism isn't any better than old press. In fact, they're worse because they've failed so much quicker. You know, uh, people say that the Internet moves at a, a breakneck speed. You know, a one week on the internet is really, you know, equal or equivalent to a year in real life. Well, we've seen that play out in games journalism. They become more corrupt than their counterparts in the real world at a quicker rate than anybody could have ever imagined happening. And so that would be what I see as one of the main issues. Why do you think it is that games journalists have been so quick to condemn their own audiences? It seems like an extraordinary thing to do, doesn't it? To alienate and to insult, to ridicule, as has happened, for example, on their private mailing list and then publicly in some of their articles. Um, Why do you think it is that games journalists have, have taken that risk? Because they must either really believe in something very strongly or simply not care what people think to take such an extraordinary step of alienating who knows, half of their readership. 
I would say that's probably a result of insulation. Um, they're kind of self-contained. Uh, we've seen, and this isn't just in game journalism. This is on a lot of uh, websites that do reporting in all different kinds of uh, all different kinds of sectors. That um, they close down comments, they close down feedback, or if they allow feedback, it's only those that are basically agreeing with whatever the author is putting forward. Uh, you know, this was kind of brought up. I believe even Ars Technica, who is involved in this now because of one of their writers, but before it talked about. You know, all these different sites uh, related to, you know, signs that uh, talk on issues about global warming or anything else have been, you know, deciding to shut down their comments because they don't want to hear feedback from their users, from their readers. And I think games journalists have really taken that and run with it. The reason that they're reacting so harshly is because they're not used to having pushback. They're not used to having actual constructive feedback. They've insulated themselves and they've created their own social network. I mean, this is all fed into this problem. There are no professional barriers in games journalism. They talk to each other on Twitter. They talk to each other on Facebook. And as we find out, they have a private secret mailing list. And so they, they create this kind of secluded network where they can talk to one another while blocking everyone out. And so when they come up with a group think decision, they can go to the consumer, they can go to the customer and the reader and say, we don't care what you have to say. You're not important. This is what we think, and we're going to shut down conversations. Even in that, um, the mailing list that came out, I mean, there were people referring to Polygon stance of just shutting down the, the comments so they don't have to hear it. There, there's a disconnect between them and us. They've forgotten what their profession is supposed to be about, and they refuse to take feedback. And I think that is really playing a major role in what's happening. They just can't believe that somebody would dare to criticize them. That just that is something that doesn't compute for them because they've been raised in a culture where they don't have to deal with criticism. In light of the disclosures that the many prominent games journalists, in fact journalists from almost every gaming publication, many technology publications as well, are sharing information and discussing the news agenda on a, a private mailing list, which their readers have no knowledge about. Are you worried about how their coverage may have been influenced over the last uh, four years since the list was set up by an Ars Technica writer? Um, well, yeah. Uh, I think this plays into what we saw happen with the Finance Capitalist. I mean, here was a group of individuals that said, we had gone to the gaming press to tell them about what had happened from our perspective, that we were targeted for harassment and our game jam was shut down. And we wanted somebody to look into it, somebody to report on it, at least take a look and try to be fair and objective. And instead, they were told, um, the person that targeted you, this would be Zoe Quinn, at the time, that's what they were told, this is the post that they put online, uh, the person that targeted you, if they're saying you're a terrible person, we're not going to look into it. And I, I think this helps to highlight the issue with, uh, I, I guess, journalists being too close to one another and too close to a source or the industry they report on. When you have people that come forward and they say, I've been targeted for harassment, I'm a game developer and I need help, I need somebody to look into this and to report on it because I'm being targeted. And the people that you're asking to report on it happen to be friends and financial contributors and in some cases have romantic relationships with the person that targeted them, they're not going to be interested in investigating. It's embarrassing for them. And they all get together, like I said, and these, these, uh, this is something they've done on social media. So I guess on the one hand, it doesn't surprise me they're doing it in secret as well, but it, it just, it's kind of gobsmacking, really, because they can't seem to understand where having these relationships and these, you know, lack of professional barriers could be an issue. Uh, when you have somebody coming to you for help and you refuse to help them because they're talking about somebody in your in-click, they're talking about somebody in your group of friends or colleagues, there's a serious issue going on. It makes me wonder... What other game devs have gone through this? What other journalists might have gone through this? You know, who wasn't part of this group and was excluded because they refused to play along? And what stories of harassment might actually be out there that they never reported on? The Finian Capitalist is one that we know about, but God knows how many others that have uh, gone through a similar thing. It's certainly true that some journalists feel excluded themselves from this group. I've heard from two people who uh, were mocked and attacked on that mailing list, and one of whom has subsequently left it, uh, who feel as though they were not part of this uh, elite group of editors and writers who shaped a lot of industry opinion. How would you characterize the difference between um, the writers, let's say, 
Kyle Orland, for example, from Ars Technica, Ben Kuchera from, uh, from Polygon. How would you characterize the difference between their attitudes uh, and styles and, and belief systems and those of the majority of their readers and perhaps the journalists who don't agree with them? What is it that separates these two people? Where's the rift coming from? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say that it's coming along ideological lines. Uh, I think these people have been influenced by, I, I guess, certain people or certain philosophies that are kind of swilling about in the gaming industry. Uh, you know, it, it kind of coincides with, you know, this mailing list was developed, what was it, about four years ago? Um, and people have said they've started to notice a shift in reporting relating to gaming, uh, you know, over the last five years. So that's kind of an interesting corollary, I guess. But uh, it, it is, if I had to sum it up, this ideology or this philosophy of kind of social justice that we've seen coming along. You know, these people really believe in it. Um, or they, you know, purport to really believe in it. I, I believe that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of profiteering going on. There's a lot of cronyism going on. You know, money is always at the center of things. Uh, but they they buy into this. There's a disconnect between how they see the reader and how the reader sees themselves. As a gamer, I enjoy my hobby because it's entertaining. I don't want politics or ideology injected into that. We've seen gamers react to this in the past when the senatorial hearings were taking place about. Uh, regulating the industry. The threat was games are too violent. Parents don't understand what they're buying for their children. If you do not regulate yourself, we will regulate you. Gamers saw that as an attack. They thought, okay, we've got you know mainly conservative, uh, conservative senators or representatives, wherever this uh, hearing was taking place, saying that if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. We're going to oh, you know oversee you. And they they didn't like that because they didn't want politics getting into gaming. Um, we saw this with Jack Thompson who was saying that, you know, video games are violent. They're creating killers. If you play Grand Theft Auto, you're going to go murder somebody. And people said, take this, you know, uh, political or ideological, you know, bullshit, if you excuse me, and push it aside because we don't believe in it. We just want our hobby to be left alone. You have no evidence of this, and you're just pushing an agenda. And I think that is the difference. The people like Kuchera and others are agenda pushers. They're not there to report on games. They just happen to be journalists that work in games. They want to push an agenda of what they believe people uh, should believe in, how they believe people should behave. And that does not appeal to your audience. You are writing about a form of entertainment. You are writing about a hobby. You know, rallying against and railing on people who play games by calling them you know, misogynist or privileged. By, you know, the amount of vitriol we've seen from the game journalists on their own social media accounts has really helped to highlight exactly what these kind of people are like. And I don't blame colleagues wanting to walk away from that mailing list. Um, from what I saw from you know, the reports that were put up, I think it was Ryan Smith that asked a very simple question amongst them all. Where do we draw the line? Why will we report on certain issues, but we won't on others? And the reaction he got was just, they were aghast, but they could not believe that he would even question the narrative that they were helping to construct. This, again, points to problems with not having professional barriers. You cannot be friends with each other to the extent that they are. You cannot collude with one another to try to put out an agenda or narrative and to insult your customers. It's bad business. It certainly seems to me that this isn't a war between uh, left and right, between controlling and libertarian. It seems to, to be a war between people who want to be political whatever their political beliefs are, and people who just want to enjoy their games. People who want to inject or import or bring into games a lot of um, social discontent and their own desire to refashion the world in whatever way they think looks better. And the vast majority who want to escape in games. And it seems to me that to write about games as being... You know, politically charged as being damaging. And of course, there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the depictions of women in video games result in, in uh, people treating women worse in real life. There's no evidence to suggest that violent video games make people violent in real life. In fact, the opposite, as we will hear from Christina Sommers, um, who's, done, who's looked into the research on this subject. What it seems to me is this is really a war between ideologues and people who just want to enjoy a, a, a pure form of, of entertainment and to try to uh, to try to bring all of that ideology and all of those those sort of bits of cultural warfare from elsewhere into gaming is to fundamentally misunderstand what gaming is for and who gamers are and why they game. Do you think that's a fair characterization? 
uh, yeah, I do. I think that it is a form of escapism. People like games because it allows them to detach themselves from real life. When I play a game, I don't necessarily want to be who I am in real life in that game. I'm playing the game to escape real life. Um, this is a sentiment that has been echoed by people under the Not Your Shield tag. They've said, don't use us as an excuse to push your agenda or your propaganda into gaming. You know, uh, all these different people identifying in all these different sexualities and ethnicities and age groups and political philosophies. We've seen a lot of people come together because I think despite all those differences that these different individuals have, they see what's going on. They understand somebody's trying to eject or inject um, an agenda in a place that it shouldn't be. It is escapism, it is entertainment, and at the end of the day, it's a business. You hurt your business when you try to make it ideological. You offend your customers and you push them away. I think advertisers are starting to realize this. Um, and I think companies have been dealing with this for a while. Uh, again, when you have a middleman like games journalism, and they're printing stories talking about how sexist and racist and violent the demographic that buys games are. It sends the wrong message to the developers and the publishers of games because it makes them seem like they have to adjust as well. They're putting out a fake narrative. They're putting out a lie. And it's confusing the people that make games and it's insulting the customers that buy them. It doesn't do any good for the industry of gaming, which is a billion-dollar international industry. And I think one of the worries people see when you kind of see this approach of an ideologue or political or whatever it happens to you, when you see somebody trying to inject a narrative, you know, entertainment is, media is, at the end of the day, the biggest form of propaganda that can exist, whether that's television or radio or gaming. So when somebody starts to put out this message of, you know, you need to adhere and be like this, you need to think the social justice mantra, uh, it can have an effect. You know, we don't want that in our, our gaming. We don't want that in our hobby. We're not propaganda for you to, you know, broadcast your beliefs. You are here to report on an industry, and you are here to appeal to us as the customers. If you want to preach social justice, if you want to preach your own political ideology, take it to another publication that's not related to gaming. Go somewhere else, because we do not want you in our hobby. That sounds to me to be good advice, because so much of the uh, anger surrounding games could equally be applied to any other medium or or any other place it's it's not really it's not really about gaming is it it's about a particular set of, of political philosophies these people have i want to ask you one more question before we go um and that's about the character of the argument so far a lot of people looking through the through the window at gamergate have been a, a little horrified at how acrimonious and uh threat laced and unpleasant a lot of the dialogue has, has gone um my experience if i'm honest is that the supporters of gamergate the people who want their video games journalism to be reformed the people who don't take kindly to baseless allegations of sexism and misogyny have been by far the more um have been by far the more polite reasonable and good-natured good-tempered good-humored uh interlocutors in the discussion and in fact, it's the other side, the angry, the furious, uh, as, as gamers would call it, social justice warriors, who have been, in some cases, behaving in, a, in an extraordinarily unacceptable way. We've got journalists such as uh, Lee Alexander, who writes for Vice and Kama Sutra and elsewhere, saying the most mind-blowingly unpleasant things, things that would not be tolerated if were she a journalist in any other vertical. And we've got all sorts of unpleasant things happening to uh, gaming forums, for example. Um, I know that the Escapist magazine was subject to a denial of service attack. Um, I, I, hate, I hate journalists who make themselves the story, but I, I've received things in the mail myself uh, that haven't been entirely unpleasant. Do you think it's fair? I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how would you characterize the difference in tone and style uh, between the two camps, if you like? Well, I think this goes back to the ideological roots of the other side, of the you know, anti-Gamergate, or however you want to describe them, uh, this group of uh, journalists and people in the industry. Uh, they have a lot of connections to people in PR and marketing, and these people know how to push a message out, and they know how to attack a movement. Um, I think they are comprised of fairly vicious and unstable people. Uh, Lay Alexander, for, ex er, for example, has made statements on Twitter and other social media saying that she is, in effect, a megaphone. She will end people's careers if you don't agree with her. Now, she has ties to Gamasutra. We had a 
last night on a stream that was going on a indie game dev, a rogue star, talk about his experience. And he said, you know, Gamasutra is a site that's used by people in the industry to connect to one another. If you're looking for work as an artist, if you're looking for work as a developer, if you want to get involved in a project, you would go to Gamasutra. So having a person like Leigh Alexander kind of, uh, you know, standing in the middle of the gateway, so to speak, on who gets in and who gets out is really, really damning um, to the industry. Uh, I know that David Jaffe has recently made a uh, comment saying that he doesn't see an issue taking place. He doesn't know any game developers or journalists that have any problems. The person last night, however, was saying quite the opposite. And it helps to highlight, too, that you know David Jaffe is putting out for his company um, applications on Gamasutra. That's, that's what the site's used for. So even Jaffe uses that site to get people to work with. So when you've got an indie dev saying, hey, these, you know, these people that are very vitriolic, that are very cruel, are kind of holding the keys to the kingdom, we're locked out. Uh, these people, it, it's really hard to explain. I guess it's hard to go into depth because we talk for an hour. But at the end of the day, it is people that know how to make money. Uh, it is people that know how to work in PR and marketing. And they are trying, and they have tried over the last month, everything they can. They tried being silent. It didn't work. They tried censoring discussion on every website they could. It didn't work. They tried attacking the audience, the consumer, with a blanket of articles in the span of a 24 hours. It didn't work. They tried to use outside media in the case of, you know, like, uh, for instance, Jen Frank writing for The Guardian. It didn't work. They're basically in a position where all the tools of the trade, as far as running PR and marketing go, have been ineffective. And they're struggling to figure out what to do. And so they're starting to revert to the more base forms of attack. So it's going to be more cruel. It's going to get meaner because nothing they've done has worked. All the things and the tools they've used before to silence people who disagree with them have completely and utterly failed. You'll see more people getting doxxed as their personal information is put out. You'll see more people getting uh, ridiculed and driven out of their jobs. You're going to see more people get things mailed to their home addresses. They want this to go away, and they will do anything they can to make that happen. Well, on that happy note, um, <laughs> I would say, uh, say thank you so much for joining us. I'm very grateful to you for making the time. Uh, if people want to keep uh, abreast of what you're up to and want to keep an eye on you, where, where should they go? Um, well, I, I run a YouTube channel, um, but I'm fairly lazy about putting videos up, but it's Internet Aristocrat. Uh, I also have a Twitter account. I'm not a fan of social media. I've really only used it in relation to, to this because I feel it's a, a big issue. But you can find me at, at int. Uh, under dash aristocrat so i'm on twitter as well